We like to read this and pray this passage from Psalms 86 each week as we come to God's Word to be changed and convicted and transformed and begin. Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I will praise you, Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever, for great is your love toward me. And at this time, the kids can be dismissed to go to junior church, or they're going to get an age-appropriate lesson for them. And they did want me to make mention of the fact that on the Sunday morning time also, we do have a kids group that meets during the growth group hour, and so we'd love to have you stay. If you're worried about child care or if you're worried about your teenagers, don't worry, we got a class for them too. So we'd love to have the whole family stick around and continue to learn and find some community here in God's house at this church. Luke chapter 12 is where we are today. We're going to finish off Luke chapter 12 and some teaching that Jesus has been doing as he continues to now make his way toward the cross. And six weeks from today, we are going to celebrate the fact that Jesus is alive on Easter Sunday That's really the whole reason why we join every single Sunday is to remember and celebrate the fact on this first day of the week that they went and found the grave was empty. And so as we get closer, though, and as Jesus continues to make his way toward the cross and the ultimate reason why he came to live a life, he's doing some intense teaching with his disciples. The big crowds that were there, he was teaching them and trying to remind them a lot of things, but especially, and then at many times very specifically, he is pulling aside the twelve, and then what we oftentimes call the inner circle, the three, Peter, James, and John, and really just giving them everything that they are going to need because very soon, Jesus physically is going to be gone. The Holy Spirit was going to come and take the place of Christ in that way of to teach and guide and convict and, and show them the right way, but they wouldn't be able to walk with Him anymore, literally speaking. They wouldn't be able to sit across a table from Him and ask Him questions because He was going to ascend back into heaven. And Jesus is trying to prepare them for His absence. This morning, as we conclude Luke chapter 12, I'm just going to preface this a little bit by saying this is a hard message. This is a difficult passage of Scripture because it's not one of those spots where it's constantly like, hey, you know what? If you do this or do that, your life is going to be fantastic. It's going to be like walking through the tulip garden and you'll be able to smell all the beautiful flowers and everything is just going to be amazing. You choose Team Jesus and all of life's problems will just melt away. I know the reason why some of you are chuckling right now is because you have been through those times where that is not the reality and or you are currently and still walking through one of those times. While this is a hard passage, I do believe also that there is some encouragement in this that we are going to be able to draw from the truth of God's Word today. And so, while it may be a time of emotion, it may be a difficult time, I want to hopefully by the end of this give you some type of life-giving truth to help you walk the path that God has for you this coming week. In Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 49, Jesus says, I have come to send fire on the earth. And how I wish that it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. Do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. For from now on, five in one house will be divided, three against two and two against three. Father will be divided against son, and son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, Mother mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Then he also said to the multitudes, whenever you see a cloud rising out of the west, immediately you say, a shower is coming, and so it is. 
When you see the south wind blow, you say there will be hot weather, and there is. But hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, and how is it you do not discern the sign at this time? Yes, and why, even of yourselves, do you not judge what is right? When you go with your adversary to the magistrate, make every effort along the way to settle with him, lest he drag you to the judge, and the judge deliver you to the officer, and the officer throw you into prison. I tell you, you will not depart from there until you have paid the very last might. As I said at the beginning, this is a very seemingly harsh passage from Jesus. But putting it in the context, we are now a couple of months from the cross as He is preparing His disciples saying, guys, I know you are looking at Me as the Messiah, thinking I'm going to bring in this peace and I'm going to get rid of all of the enemies of this earth and then you're going to be ruling and reigning right alongside of Me and it's going to be awesome. You're going to have all power and there's going to be no more problems because King Jesus is here. He says, I'm telling you guys, there is a fire that is coming. A fire that is going to sweep across this land. It is going to bring judgment. It is going to bring purification. But, it's not going to be pleasant. When this purification is taking place and when there are people that continue to reject Jesus Christ, and if you will claim the name of Jesus as your own, and you will proudly stand up and say, I am one of His. I am a Christian. I am a disciple and a follower of Christ. There are going to be people that are going to come against you. Now, if we just look at this and Jesus says, you think I came to bring peace? Well, wait a minute, how does that with the fact that we were in Christmas and says that uh, I bring you good tidings of great joy which will be to all people? Isn't He called the Prince of Peace? Yes, He is called the Prince of Peace eternally speaking. He can give you peace and joy and contentment in your soul in the deepest part of who you are, that part of you that will last forever. However, in this life, if your definition of peace is simply an absence from all trouble, Jesus never promised that, not even once. And this passage here shows the exact opposite of that. (laughs) Saying, yes, I did come to bring peace for your soul, but when it comes to this earth, I am actually bringing a sword of division because there are going to be some people that do not want the peace truth see this is not just a 21st century thing so many people today think oh we're so we're so amazing and how i've got my truth you've got your truth we got all these truths that are all over the place and you simply live your truth there is no the truth there is no absolute truth you see jesus is fighting against that mentality two thousand years ago saying there will be people that want to reject the absolute truth of who christ is and what he came to do and if you say you're going to be one of his you want to be a follower of what was originally known as the way you want to follow jesus people are going to divide against you because truth divides truth causes people that want to live in a lie to be very very uncomfortable I don't care if you're saved or unsaved. If you want to live a lie in your life and the truth of God's Word and His Spirit begins to convict you, you are going to be very uncomfortable trying to fight against the truth. And it's very sad. That it could possibly be that, well, you know, we, we've got family and I'm, I'm supposed to be close to my family and I'm supposed to stick with them. I understand that because we spend so much time with family, maybe you grew up in a very close-knit family. And we were always there and we went on family vacations together and we spent so much time playing card games or, or table games or out in the backyard at the pool or doing barbecues or at the park. We have all this memory and emotion and nostalgia invested in these relationships. 
But Jesus says there could come a day when if those people reject the truth of who I am and you want to live for the truth, it will cause division in your family. Because they want to live their truth, a.k.a. a lie, And lies and darkness hate truth and light. Jesus says, I'm distressed right now. Because I have a mission that I have come to do. I have this baptism that I am to be baptized with. And remember, when we see the word baptism, the English translators they should have just translated the word instead of making up a new English word. It means to be immersed, dunked, plunged. Jesus was not just sprinkled with our sin. He did not just get a little bit of our sin. He did not just take a small portion of our judgment. He was baptized into our judgment when He hung on the cross. He became our sin, it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. First Peter also talks about how he took all of that punishment, all of that judgment from God on the cross. He was an innocent life that gave his life on behalf of the guilty. He said, I am distressed because I know what's coming. I know the mission that I have, and I believe also Jesus was distressed with the fact that some people would reject that truth. He says, I've got a gift for you. It's all paid for. That was the purpose of the cross. I'm here to give you life. But you must repent or turn away from thinking you can do it on your own. I'll take care of my eternity. I can take care of my soul. I've got this all done. I'm a good person. I've never killed anybody. I've never stolen much. I've never... We can list off all kinds of stuff, but it's not good enough. You must be perfect. And that's why Jesus, the perfect sacrifice, took that punishment on the cross. And now he's saying, I have a gift for you. Just receive it. Believe in what I have done, the finished work. But then after that, I can see Jesus also looking forward to the time that his disciples would be separated from their families when it would cause division among people that you were so close to. There were some of you I was even sharing with my wife as I knew this passage was coming that I know that you're struggling with this right now. Today. Your families have been torn asunder because people don't want to believe and accept the truth of Jesus Christ. And believe me that I was praying for you this week. Spending time bringing those loved ones that I know that your families have been ripped apart because of the truth. You have been divided Praying, Lord, let the light of the Gospel into their hearts. Let them see the truth of Christ. Let them submit. I know there are parents that are praying for children. I know that some of you in here are children that are praying for your parents. I know there are many of you in here that are praying for other people that you know, neighbors, co-workers, people that you have deep relationships with that you care for so much. However, without this base of acceptance of who Christ is, the koinonia, the fellowship, that togetherness, that community that we all long for, it cannot be found if we don't have that same foundation with Christ. However, this is one of the things, and I hope I can encourage you a little bit this morning, that because God knew, because the Gospel would bring division in this earth, and because it would bring separation of biological families, 
He set up an institution known as the church to be a place to where even if you have no one else on this earth, you still have your church family. You have brothers and sisters who love you and care for you. And we have that foundation. We have that camaraderie. We have that fellowship in Jesus Christ. And that's why even here, Jesus was trying to tell His disciples, hey guys, there's going to be division coming among people that you love. But I tell you, run then to your brothers in Christ. Be there for one another. Suffer the fellowship of His sufferings together. (laughs) And rejoice when good things do come. But That's why I'm such a fervent believer in the New Testament principle of the local church. And we are meant to be here for one another. We are meant to commune together. We are meant to be there and fellowship I know we kind of throw that word around a bit. Oh, we had a fellowship today because we had a potluck. I guarantee you can eat food and not have fellowship. But what fellowship is genuinely all about is that we are in this together. That word koinonia means we have intimate knowledge of one another. We know each other's struggles. We're not using that knowledge of one another's struggles in order to heap judgment upon someone else, but to pray and come alongside of them and say, hey brother, I'm here with you. Hey, you fell on, fell on the ground. Let me help you back up. The world is dividing us enough. Those that want to believe in the truth from those who want to reject the truth. Church, let's not be more divisive inside of His body than we have to be. Now again, some people want to just throw off all doctrine and throw off all truth. Just hold hands with everybody and sing kumbaya. That is not what I'm saying. No, the doctrine and the truth of God's Word is what binds us together. It is the glue that holds us in deep fellowship with one another. So when we see lies happening in the lives of our brothers and sisters in Christ, we come alongside of them not to cast aspersions and judgments and say, hey, I see your life heading in a wrong direction. And I'm here to help you out of it. So yeah, the world is going to be divided from us because of the truth of God's Word. But we as the church body, we should be there for each other. And then together as we get healed, and as we get strengthened in God's Word, and as we are there for one another, then we link arms and we go out into the world. We don't just bunker down and say, okay, Jesus, come. Finally, please, get us out of this terrible place. The world hates us. No, we go with the fire and the passion of the Holy Spirit and the truth and the light of the Gospel, and we go and shine that light in the darkness. Because they need it. And nope, not everybody is going to believe. But some will. And those few that do, the Bible says that the angels in heaven rejoice at one sinner that repents. Even if the entirety of the rest of our church life, we go out and we spread the seed of the Gospel, and over the next 70 years, one person comes. You know what happened in heaven? A huge party happened because of the one. Now I'm praying that God definitely uses us to bring more than one over the next 70 years, but if it's only one and that's His will, then so be it. But let us not stand before Jesus Christ someday and say, well, I was scared because it would bring division, so I don't want to have to do anything kind of scary and uncomfortable. No, I want to stand before God unashamed and say, you know what, Lord? I boldly went in Your power. I was praying that you would fill me with your spirit and I gave the truth of your word. So Lord, I'm so glad to be able to meet you face to face today. But I want to be able to stand before him unashamed, knowing that I left it all on the field. I want to have nothing left in my tank when I get to heaven.
So again, I want to encourage you that if you are being separated and divided from your family, I've experienced it as well. I know I've shared this in the past, but I still had someone that came to me one time shortly after my wife and I had been married. I graduated from Bible college and people knew that, that I had felt called to become a pastor. Had someone come to me and say, all right, so when are you going to leave all this religious nonsense behind and get a real job? That hurts. I care about you. I love you. We've spent all this time together. We've gotten to know each other and, and that's the bomb you're going to drop on me right now? I've had other people throughout the years say things to me, maybe not quite that frank, but in the same vein. And it hurts. But it's also just sometimes Jesus, he's not saying this to say, hey, this is, this is what you should look forward to, but he is saying this is a reality. Be prepared. So that was kind of, he finishes off his discussion now with the little, his disciples. Back in verse 22, he had turned from the crowd to his disciples. And so really 22 through 53 there was kind of a more intimate conversation. And now it seems like he turns back to the multitude, the giant crowd that's standing around. And he says, whenever you see a cloud rising out of the west, immediately you say a shower is coming. Don't we even do that too nowadays? We and now we've got radar and news and we've got the weather channel and this and that. And we look up and say, oh, hey, there's a storm coming. Be prepared. Red, night, or red sky at night is a sailor's delight. Red sky in the morning, sailors take warning. And all these other things that really just don't really mean anything because the weather can change at the drop of a hat. All these little sayings that we've got, we've got stuff, and Jesus is just saying, you're able to recognize that, but you can't, you're, you're not perceptive enough to then see that the Messiah is standing right before you. So, so then why aren't you judging what is right in verse 57? You go with your adversary to the magistrate, you go to the civil court in a sense of the day. Instead of trying to figure out some way to settle this and get it right and make sure that the debt has been paid, you make the adversary drag you before the judge and then the judge pronounces you guilty and then he turns you over to the officer and then the officer throws you in jail until every last piece of the debt that you owe has been paid. The reason why Jesus turns to the crowd and begins to talk once again is to say hey every single one of you that are here have a debt that you cannot pay and yet you're arguing with the adversary thinking oh i can do this on my own i can overcome sin i'm powerful enough i'm good enough i got this he says but when you stand before the judge of god someday if you claim anything other than jesus christ alone to say that's he paid my debt and God says you will be turned over and you will be judged for all eternity until every last might is paid. So, so be prepared. In, instead of waiting until you stand before the judge, Jesus is saying, here, I'll pay your debt right now. Let's get this settled. Let's get this taken care of. That's what we remember today as we take communion. As we come to the Lord's table. We are remembering the fact that Jesus gave His body to be broken on our behalf. His precious, perfect, divine blood was spilled out on our behalf. And now when God looks at us, He no longer sees adulterer. He no longer sees liar. He no longer sees thief. He no longer sees lazy person he no longer sees anger and wrath and malice and everything else when he looks at you as a christian now he sees the perfect blood of christ and sees perfectly righteous he sees jesus on your behalf on your account your debt has been paid 
So if you are here this morning, you're not sure whether that debt has been paid, that sin. And I invite you to come. And let's go to Christ this morning. You can ask Him to forgive you, and He will. Maybe you've been struggling with it, thinking, but I've done too much wrong. I'm, I'm too terrible of a person. If you knew what I have done. You know what? The Bible gives us all kinds of descriptions of people. People that were liars and thieves and charlatans. People that were murderers. And every single one of them were able to come to Christ, ask for His forgiveness, and God gave it without a second thought. He wants us to come to Him. He wants to have that debt paid. But you must simply ask. Simply believe that He loves you. That He paid that price for you. And then come to Him and say, please Lord, forgive me. Don't wait until you're standing before the judge to realize it's too late. Because if you suddenly decide as you're standing before God someday and say, yes, Lord, now I believe, he'll say, it's too late. Maybe you're almost convinced today. Then come forward and let's talk about that. Any burden, any concern, any anger, any, any, anything you have against God whatsoever, any questions you may have, I invite you, I implore you, to come. Those of you that are in here today that do claim Jesus Christ as Savior as we approach the communion table in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 it says that we need to come before Him in a worthy manner. We need to prepare our hearts. Number one, to come in a worthy and prepared manner is do you know Jesus is your Savior to begin with? The symbolism here, the broken body, the, 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 the broken bread and the cup, they don't really mean anything if you have not first accepted Him. Have you stood up now, number two, and publicly identified with Him and say, yes, I am a believer. I am a follower of Christ. I have no qualms about letting everybody know. But what if that means division? And what if that means heartache? And what if that means people don't like me anymore? A Christian will stand up and say, if that is it, Lord, then so be it. Because, Lord, I need you. Have you stood up and proclaimed that he is your Savior through believer's baptism? Signifying his death, burial, and resurrection as you come up out of the water saying, I'm now going to walk in newness of life. The old things are passed away. Behold, I am now a new creature in Christ. And then number three, have you spent some time with God recently saying, Lord, I, I know I'm not perfect. I'm still struggling with sin. I'm still trying to overcome. But have you spent some time admitting that to Him? <laughs> have you spent some time confessing that to Him? Saying, Lord, I thank You that even though I'm not perfect, I'm still a part of Your family. Even though I still get tripped up by sin at times, thank you that you don't cast me off. But Lord, I want to admit that I recognize your spirit convicted me and I want to lay it down right now and say, I don't want to do that sin anymore. Please, Lord, take the desire for this from me. You can say, yes, I'm a Christian. Yes, I've been baptized. And yes, I have spent some time confessing to God once again. Then by all means... 1 Corinthians chapter 11 says, Then let him come and eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Christ wants you to come to his table. Christ wants you to spend this time of worship remembering what he has done. But come in a worthy manner. 
we'll have some time of quiet where you can spend some time praying. Or maybe you've got questions about what it means to be a Christian. Or maybe you've been struggling with something. Or maybe you just like to pray and say, Lord, I know there's a lot of division in my family right now. Maybe you want to come and pray here at the front silently. Maybe you want to kneel right where you are in your chair. Maybe you'd like to come and pray with someone and say, I'm, I'm hurting right now because I do have some division in my family. I do know someone that they need Christ. Let's lift up their name to God right now. And let's lay those burdens down at His almighty hand, or at His feet and let His almighty hands wrap His arms around you and rest in His power. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank You for today and I thank You for this time that we could spend in Your Word. And Lord, even these harder passages, these times that can seem like they don't have a lot of comfort in them. I thank You, Lord, that You knew this very day, this very moment was going to happen before You created the foundations of the world. Lord, I thank You that You had a plan for our lives from before the creation of the world. I thank You, Lord, that You, ha- you are with us right now. That You are walking with us. That Your Spirit is here with us right now. And Lord, no matter what we may be struggling with, that You promise never to leave us nor forsake us. Thank You, Lord, for giving us a church family. Thank You for giving us a body in Christ that we can lean on during these times when we are suffering in this world. So Father, let us rise up and be there for one another. Let us glorify Your name. Lord, let us continue to worship You as we come to the communion table today. Let us remember all that you sacrificed for us on the cross. Please, Lord, be working now in this time of silence as we pray to you and talk to you in our hearts, as we lift up to you those that we are hurting over today and grieving over because of their decision to reject the truth. Lord, let us be comforted right now. Wrap your arms around us. Let us feel your presence in Jesus' holy name. I'll be here at the front if you'd like to pray.